Go for it. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gail Fatizi, HGAR 2020 president. I want to thank everyone for being here with us this morning and hope everyone is doing well. I know that uh, we are all eagerly awaiting the day that we get to reopen our industry as a whole. And I know that the agents I'm speaking with are all very excited about that reopening and being able to meet with clients, open doors, all of those things that they're used to doing, obviously doing it all smartly and safely. But I know that all of you as broker owner managers have a lot more on your plate and a lot more to worry about in terms of reopening than the agents do. Uh, you've got offices to be concerned about and making sure that everything process protocol wise is all done properly. And there's a lot of accountability with this. So uh, the ESD has given guidelines that are quite extensive for those of you who've seen that 15 page document. Um, and it addresses three different areas, people, places, and processes. And we want to be able to give you the information that you need to safely reopen your offices and follow all of the guidance. So we do have, uh, we're, we're very happy to have our guests here to do this presentation with you this morning in advance of hopefully that June 9th that we're, date that we're all hoping will happen next week. So I'm going to turn it over to our CEO, Richard Haggerty, to make introductions of our guest presenters today. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Gail. And for those of you who uh, read my COVID-19 update uh, yesterday afternoon, the governor in his uh, press conference yesterday did indicate that the Mid-Hudson region is on schedule as of right now to go into phase two on June 9th. So that is exciting news. But as Gail just alluded to, there is a tremendous amount of detail in the uh, opening, reopening guidelines. And we are so lucky to have uh, both Libby Rents and Anthony Gatto joining us from NASAR today. Uh, Libby Rents is the Vice President of Finance and Chief of Staff for the New York State Association of Realtors. And Anthony Gatto is General Counsel and Director of Legal Services. Uh, I believe that we're gonna be starting off with Libby, but I'm throwing a little bit of a curveball. Uh, at the very beginning, because I just want to very briefly ask Anthony to talk about the fact that we do have some other guidelines that are coming in place as of June 20th concerning fair housing. And I don't want those requirements to get lost in the shuffle of all of the reopening activities that are going on, uh, because they are just as important, uh, especially uh, in this current environment where we really, as an association, have to uphold the tenants of fair housing every single minute of every single day. So Anthony, if you could just briefly touch on those requirements that go into effect on June 20th, I'd appreciate it. We will continue to notify our members concerning those requirements uh, by individual email, but I just don't want to get these important requirements lost in the shuffle. We're going to devote the, the large majority of the program about to the uh, phase two reopening but I would like Anthony to briefly talk about those fair housing requirements before we pass it off to Libby. All right. Thank you, Richard. And I'll try to make it brief, although that never really works with me. But um, so the fair housing regulations, I'm just going to tell you, were passed as a result of the uh, Newsday expose um, about fair housing issues in Long Island. Uh, as a result of that, the governor uh, required the Department of State to pass regulations that would require. Uh, fair housing, increase in fair housing, uh, notification to consumers and, and education. So the, the new regulation is cut up into three sections. Uh, the first section um, is section 175.28, and this is contained in the same uh, area of the regulations that the advertising regulations are contained in. Uh, so it's in the same uh, section 175. So the first requirement is a fair housing disclosure form. And uh, your requirement for that is you must provide it to every consumer, regardless of the type of property. So uh, residential, condos, co-ops, commercial, vacant land, new construction, it doesn't make a difference. At first substantive contact, you must provide the fair housing, sorry, the housing and anti-discrimination disclosure form uh, to the consumer. Um, one of the... I think um, more positive aspects of the regulation is that uh, NYSAR negotiated into the, the text of the regulation the ability for licensees to deliver the form electronically 
rather than have to provide it in paper form uh, as we're used to with, with other disclosures. So within the regulation, it permits you to deliver it electronically, uh, including using something like DocuSign or some third-party uh, app, uh, email or text, uh, so long as the communication contains uh, some information that uh, the, the link um, to the form uh, is that for a fair housing disclosure form. So you don't really have to have the consumer sign it. I know in many transactions that are outside of residential, um, you know, you're not going up to someone for a commercial property and having them sign a stack of New York State disclosure forms. So delivery by email would be sufficient. Now, with the form itself, the broker is required to retain a copy of the form for three years. So for a piece of paper, that's easy. The person signs it, the broker retains a copy of that signed form for three years. But for electronic delivery, if it's an electro electronic signature, you always get that information. So you would, you would retain the electronic copy of the signed document and then whatever log that third-party app has to show um, when the person opened it up and signed it. But if you're emailing it or texting it, um, there's no requirement that they sign it and send it back. So um, you can obviously require them to do so if you want, but if not, you would then need to retain a copy of the electronic transmission. Uh, so it would be perhaps in your sent file folder for emails. Um, you would just need to show proof that the uh, document was sent. Um, there are a lot of third-party mail apps that brokers are beginning to utilize to do this automatically, uh, where the licensee would go to a certain web page and just enter in the consumer's email address, and that would automatically generate an email with the required information to be sent to the, to the uh, consumer, uh, thereby meeting the requirements of the uh, regulation. Um, but that's a broker-by-broker broker determination. So. Uh, the disclosure form is the first part, like I mentioned. And like I said, just give it to every single consumer at first substantive contact. And it can be done, like I said, in paper form or electronically. The second requirement under the regulation is the fair housing notice, which is different than the disclosure form. So this is the, the disclosure form, the disclosure form. The notice is really a poster. And there are uh, a few requirements for the poster. The first is every broker's office or branch office must display the poster in the window if the window is viewable from the sidewalk, if the broker posts other items in the window, um, then they would have to post it in the window. If it's not viewable from the sidewalk or you don't post other things in your window or you're not permitted to post things in your window, you would then need to display it in the same area where the broker's real estate license is displayed pursuant to the real property law. Uh, NYSAR is recommending that the size of the notice uh, be uh, at least 8.5 by 11, um, 8 by 10 if you want to use a picture frame to put it in, uh, but no smaller by 8.5 by 11 uh, for posting at the broker's office and branch office. Uh, the second requirement as far as the posting of the notice is concerned is that uh, you must have it on display at every open house. Um, I think for residential, it's going to be very easy. Wherever the sign-in book is, if you still utilize the sign-in book, you just put it on display there in one of those clear plexiglass stands that they sell at Staples or Office Max, um, or post it on the door or the entryway or someplace where anyone who comes in would be able to see it. Uh, so that's the posting rule for every open house. Um, you also are required to have the notice available upon request at open houses and showings. So you're not required to give the poster to consumers, but if asked, you would have to provide them with a copy. I followed up with the Department of State and said, you know, it's cumbersome to make a licensee have to carry a folder full of all these different kinds of forms that they may or may not have to provide to a consumer. You know, would it be okay if they were asked that they just provide the link to the notice, and, and the department said, yes, you could do something as simple as that, which could also be um, a simple email with a link to the department's uh, uh, site, because uh, the Department of State is housing both of these forms on their site. Uh, there are links to those particular notices, 
Uh, the regulation actually says the department will supply a link, so they have supplied links. Um, so I'm, I'm deviating. Uh, so that was uh, that was showings and, and uh, open houses as far as delivery is concerned, if you're asked. Only if you're asked as far as the notice is concerned. Uh, the other aspect of the notice is that every website owned and operated by a broker or one of their associated licensees must contain a link to the fair housing notice. Uh, the link to that notice must be prominent and conspicuous, uh, which means that the consumer should not have to scroll down your web page to find it, nor should it be buried inside a menu. Um, the advertising regulations require the broker's name to be on every web page in a clear and conspicuous manner. Uh, the same holds true um, as far as the standard for the fair housing notice. Uh, you could provide some text that says something as simple as uh, fair housing notice or housing and anti-discrimination notice with a link to the department's website, um, and that would meet that requirement. But just remember, it should be above the fold. Um, <clears throat> nothing prevents you from uh, having additional text if you want to. You know, ABC, Re Re ABC Realty, you know, believes in, uh, you know, opportunity for housing for all. Uh, you know, please click this link for information from the New York State Department of uh, uh, um, Human Rights regarding fair housing. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but something as simple as fair housing notice would suffice. So we did the disclosure form. We did the notice. I'll cover the recording real quick for the schools. Uh, every real estate school that is offering a CE class that is giving credit uh, for uh, discrimination in real property, we call it fair housing, but there's the three hours that are required of your 22 and a half. Um, any course which is giving credit uh, towards that must be recorded in video and audio. Uh, the school is required to retain a copy of that video for a period of one year. Uh, the schools are only required to video the instructor. They are not required to videotape the attendees. Uh, the state's only concern is that the instructor is covering information that was contained in the outline that was submitted and approved by the Department of State, and that they are taking the proper amount of time to teach that particular section um, relating to discrimination. As you know, you need three hours, and the instructor should be teaching three hours of it. Um, uh, the expose on Long Island found that some of those instructors were not doing that, uh, which led to the department uh, requiring the recording of all uh, CE courses relating to discrimination. So. Uh, that's the uh, fair housing regulation in a nutshell. Uh, we have uh, some FAQs up on NYSARD.com under the legal section under fair housing. Uh, so if you have any other questions, go there. Or you can actually call us on the hotline as well. Thank you so much, Anthony. Really appreciate that. And the NYSARD website is a tremendous, tremendous resource that I encourage all of you to use. Uh, our site, HDR.com, links to it. And it's just you know, a lot of times we want stuff handed to us in nice little neat packages, but with a lot of these issues, we have to take the time to really read and educate ourselves. Uh, so now we want to get to the, uh, the reopening for phase two. I'm going to pass it off to Libby. Uh, in addition to her uh, responsibilities as chief of staff and vice president of finance, she also is responsible the, for the actual physical plant of the NYSAR offices up in Al Albany. Uh, so she's having to prepare her own plan on behalf of the Student Association for their reopening. Uh, so Libby, I'm passing it off to you. And just one quick point, any questions that you may have, we'll address those at the end of the session. Just type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Great. Thanks, Rich. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you're all staying healthy and safe. Um, as Rich said, I'm going to talk to you about reopening your office and your requirements for maintaining the safety of your agents after Anthony will talk to you about the requirements uh, when you're working with your clients. So let me begin by sharing my screen. Just a moment here. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. Not yet. No? Oh, there we go. Now it's working. Great, thank you. 
So if you haven't done so already, I recommend that you go to the forward.newyork.gov website and take a look at the phase two industry guidance. You'll see here I have it open and uh, for the real estate section. So you're going to have a couple of requirements that you need to do. One thing that you'll need to do is to create a safety plan. And you'll find that there's a template right here on the website for the safety plan. Simple to fill out. And once we go through the other part of the presentation, you'll have all the answers that you need for your safety plan. So this is the safety plan that you must complete. And then you need to hang this in a con conspicuous location in your office so that it's visible to um, staff and anybody else who comes into your office. The other thing that you're going to need to do is to read and affirm the detail guidelines that have been provided. You'll see there's several pages here of guidelines and at the bottom, you'll see a link where you need to affirm that you understand your obligation um, in accordance with the guidance that's been provided. So that's the affirmation that you need to do. You'll find it again here, uh, read and affirm detailed guidelines. And lastly, they have a great summary of these guidelines right here. So this is what we're gonna focus on right now. You need to um, provide social distancing within your office. It's mandatory to the extent that it's possible. So you're going to want to do things like move your desk so that there are, there's six feet of space between people. If you're not able to do that, you should probably install plexiglass barriers on the desks. And um, the NAR Team Store website is a good resource for those. They actually have barriers that set right on the desk so they don't have to be physically um, installed, you know, with screws and bolts and things like that. Um, in conference, room, conference rooms and waiting areas, you'll probably want to remove some of the chairs so that you can maintain distance between people. Uh, if you have an elevator in your building, um, you are limited to one person on the elevator unless people are wearing masks. And if they're wearing masks, then you're limited to 50% of the maximum occupancy on the elevator. It's recommended that you put dots on the floor so that you can that indicate what a six foot distance is. Um, perhaps if you have an office and you want people to stay outside the door of the office to maintain the six feet, you can put one of these um, dots on the floor to indicate that that's where they should stop and stand to speak with you. Um, if it's possible, they would like us to put arrows showing traffic patterns in the office to reduce face-to-face -face contact so that um, people are walking up one corridor and down a different corridor or staying to the right on each side so that they're not coming face-to-face. -face. It's recommended that you restrict or adjust your office hours to reduce the number of people in the office at the same time. Um, and if your office is receiving deliveries, they suggest that you have the delivery driver leave things either outside the door or in the vestibule, the entryway, things like that. At NYSAR, we're hanging signs in our vestibule requesting that drivers call us and we will come down and meet them in the vestibule to get whatever it is that they're trying to deliver so that they won't actually be entering our building. Uh, lastly, you want to prohibit non-essential visitors. So if in the past, people brought their children into work for fun sometimes, or just that they were running in and out very quickly. They are um, it's suggested that you don't do that. So the next section of this guidance um, pertains to protective equipment, PPE. It's the broker's responsibility to provide acceptable face coverings for the people who are in their office. So you have to make sure that you have an adequate supply of face coverings and you need to teach people how to properly put on and take off a mask. So I wanna let you know the CDC actually has um, a poster for doing this. It's an infographic that you could print and laminate. So the CDC actually has a lot of good um, infographics on their website and we at NYSAR have laminated infographics for um, putting on and on and taking, putting a mask on and taking it off, as well as proper hand washing and social distancing. So um, at NYSER, we also have cleaning stations that we've set up that have masks, gloves, hand sanitizer, tissues, um, and disinfecting spray.
spray or wipes. We're having a little trouble getting wipes, so we're going to have to use a dis disinfecting spray with paper towels until we can obtain more wipes. Um, in your case, you may want to add disposable shoe coverings that your agents can take um, and wear when they walk into somebody else's house. So at NYSTAR, we installed a touchless thermometer in the back hallway of the building, which is where staff comes into the building when they, from the parking lot. And our staff has been asked to take their temperature daily before entering the office. So anyone with an elevated temperature will need to go home. And in our office, we've told people if they're uncomfortable with the distance between desks or if they would prefer it, we will provide a plexiglass barrier on their desk. The next section I'm going to skip because that pertains to um, in-person showings and I want, and Anthony will be covering that. So we're going to talk about hygiene and cleaning. So one of the things that we've done is we purchased lanyards and e for each of the staff members and the lanyards are going to have touchless keys on them. Um, I don't know if you've seen these, but it allows you to push buttons without actually touching the buttons with your fingers or to open a door handle without touching the door handle. So each staff member will have a lanyard with a touchless key on it and also a personal container, like a travel size container of wipes for them to use. And we were able to um, secure the travel size wipes. Um, we're asking our staff if they use anything in the office that might be touched by somebody else, whether it's a copier or a coffee maker um, or a, you know, if they're upstairs in the kitchen doing anything that they should clean the surface before and after. So if everybody's cleaning before and after, we're pretty confident that they're not going to be spreading germs. Our staff has been asked to eat at their desks or outside of the building until further notice. And in our office, we plan to prop open some of the doors that don't need to be closed during business hours. So um, we have a secure front entrance, so obviously that's going to be closed, but once they walk up to our office on the second floor, the office door will be open and the door between our office and um, the building next door, which we also utilize, that will be open during office hours. Um, with regard to communication, in addition to having that uh, safety plan, which is mandatory, We've provided um, a more thorough plan for our staff. We inform them that we are installing touchless faucets, touchless toilets, touchless urinals throughout the building. So that we, um, you know, we're always trying to look out for their safety and we feel that that was something that was important for us to do. As I mentioned before, we're hanging the laminated CDC guideline posters for people. And one of the questions that's on that safety plan is whether or not you are providing information on these things. So that allows you to do that, check that box. Um, we're requesting that meetings within the office be held remotely via Zoom or Slack if possible. So we're not gonna have departmental meetings in the conference room. We're gonna actually be sitting in our own offices together. Um, you'll see in here that it's required that you maintain a cleaning log just to ensure that certain surfaces like hand railings, countertops, things like that are cleaned daily. Um, we are also required to maintain a log of who is coming into the building. So our receptionist will be um, maintaining a log of staff and visitors who actually enter the NYSAR office. And the other thing is that you are required to have your workers um, complete a daily questionnaire that talks about whether or not they've been exposed. Um, to COVID-19. And so it's whether they were directly exposed or whether they, um, you see it right here, if they've had contact with somebody, if they have symptoms, things like that. Every single day they have to provide you with information and if they've been exposed, they will need to um, have a 14 day quarantine, obviously outside of the office. So at NYSAR, we've created an online form for our staff to complete. And that way we can collect the information and ensure that everybody does it every single day. So that is a requirement. Um, so there are several things that you need to do. First is the safety plan using that template that I showed you on the forward.newyork.gov website. You'll need to read and affirm that you understand your obligation to operate in accordance with the guidance. You need to acquire masks and cleaning products. 
rearrange your office for proper social distancing and have staff report daily regarding the potential exposure. And lastly, you need to follow the guidelines that you've committed to. So I think that covers it. And Anthony can talk to you about the guidance with working um, with your clients. So stay safe, everyone, and uh, hope to see you back at our meetings or in our offices soon. Libby, before we pass it off to uh, Anthony, it, it seems very clear that we're not gonna be bringing all staff back at the same time, given the guidance. If the staff is not physically coming into the office, would they have to complete the health questionnaire? Um, my understanding is no. If they're not physically coming into the office, then they are not obligated. If, if they're coming to the office that day, they need to do that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anthony, passing it off to you. And thank you, Libby, that was great. You're welcome. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'll be referring to two different documents today. The first one is the real estate master guidance under phase two. And the second is the summary uh, of that document, uh, both of which are available on the uh, New York Forward website and also in the FAQs of NYSART.com. Uh, for those of you uh, in anticipation of opening, you should really read the real estate master guidance. Uh, that's also the document that brokers and or the owners or their designated agent are going to have to affirm uh, prior to opening under phase two. So the most important thing for brokers and, and um, some of the ones in phase one didn't understand, or some of the ones who are currently open in phase two didn't understand that uh, the broker is gonna need to affirm this before any of their licensees uh, can uh, work under phase two guidance. So you should really take a long, hard look at this document over the weekend to see if you are ready to affirm it and open up for business uh, whatever day next week the governor designates your area to be in phase two. Um, <clears throat> as Libby said, it's cut up into a bunch of different sections. Um, I'm gonna cover the part about uh, real estate showings, which is under uh, section one, people, letter D, um, covers what you are required to do as far as real estate showings are concerned. Now, the, the title of the section is residential in-person property showings and related activities. It applies to all showings, not just residential, also applies to commercial. Uh, the other night we had a, uh, a Zoom meeting with all the local board council. Um, John and Brian were both on it um, from Hagar. Uh, and it was everyone's opinion that there was enough other references within the guidance to say that it applies to um, all uh, showings and open houses, not just for residential. So it's the entire broad spectrum of, of real estate um, that's covered under the guidance documents. So again, and I want to reiterate this, brokers, make sure you read and affirm this before your licensees go out there and start operating under phase two guidance. Um, because uh, as the responsible party, either the broker or the owner, um, <clears throat> you are responsible to make sure your licensees are doing exactly what the guidance requires them to do. Uh, it would not hurt you to circulate the requirements to them. Uh, the summary sheet is great for that, or just cut and paste the section out of the guidance document uh, and provide it to them uh, as what their responsibilities are. Uh, one thing that the guidance document does early on is uh, it defines what an employee or employees refers to. And in this case, it also refers to uh, associated licensees. Uh, so independent contractors for the purpose of this document only when referring to employee employees also refers to independent contractors. So as Libby mentioned previously, uh, for the office, um, brokers would be required to provide uh, face coverings um, to the individuals coming into the office if they don't already have their own. Nothing prevents uh, the employee or independent contractor from having their own appropriate face covering and they go on to uh, define appropriate face covering as being cloth, a surgical mask, or something of, of uh, uh, greater protection than that, um, N95, KN95, et cetera. Um, but they talk about work sites outside of the actual office, and it's my opinion that uh, a property that's being shown could also be determined to be a work site. So uh, the licensee, uh, again, if they don't have an appropriate face covering, uh, the broker should be uh, providing those face coverings to their licensees who are out having in-person contact um, uh, with members of the public for purposes of uh, real estate activities. 
So how can we do shelling, Drake? That, that's the big question. And, and I think that the guidelines are reasonable as far as uh, what your requirements are. I think they could have been um, a lot more restrictive, uh, but they're very uh, in line with common sense as far as what you think they should provide. So uh, the first thing is you can have in-person showings. However, the property cannot be occupied at the time of the showing it means that if someone is residing there, that person must leave or people must leave uh, the unit being shown. Uh, whether it be a, a single family property, a condo or a co-op or an apartment uh, for a lease, um, no one can be in that unit or property uh, at the time of the showing. Uh, all parties must wear masks, which means all licensees must wear masks and all individuals who are being shown the property must wear masks. Um, the guidance said that the broker should provide masks to consumers, not that they must, it's recommended, it's not required. It's required they give them to employees, independent contractors, but it's not required for them to give them to consumers. However, uh, I think the issue we're going to have here is that if consumers don't have their own appropriate face coverings, um, sellers have the rights to say that, that you can't come into my property. Right? Sellers have the right to, to reject consumers um, under COVID-19, which I'll get to in a little bit. But um, if the buyers, in this case, if it's a purchase, the buyers don't have appropriate face coverings, um, they're not going to be able to show in the property. So if you have extras um, as a licensee, as a broker, you can provide them with that uh, to give to consumers if you want to, but it's not required, it's only recommended. The other thing, too, is that you can require more than just a mask, right? The state requires the mask, but they recommend gloves and booties uh, if you want to provide those, but those would have to be provided. Um, or if the seller wanted a higher level of, uh, of uh, protection above and beyond face coverings, um, I don't think you can require a purchaser to go out and have to buy certain items above and beyond the mask. So if there's a higher requirement, I believe that would have to be provided, um, such as gloves or, or booties in this situation. Um, you should limit the showing uh, to one party in the property, meaning that uh, the licensee and the buyer buyers. Um, you should make every effort not to have uh, non-essential individuals accompany the showing. So um, if Bob and Jane are going to be buying the property, uh, there's no reason for Bob and Jane's respective parents to come with them unless they're going to be on the deed. You want to try to minimize the number of people you have in a property at any given time. Uh, you can try to restrict that to the parties that will be on the contract or lease if you want to. Uh, the state is advising, although not, not uh, requiring, that uh, children not attend showings. Um, they can be left outside with appropriate supervision. Um, uh, but again, it's not a requirement, uh, but it's something that uh, they're, they're, they're recommending. So again, showings should be limited to the party um, that is looking at the property, whether it be for sale or for lease. All parties should have uh, a mask on. Um, uh, licensees should make every effort to stagger showing times so that you don't have party one and party two crossing paths as they go through the door. Uh, one of uh, uh, another MLS uh, uses a showing time service and, and uh, previously uh, showing times were cut off into 15 minute increments. They changed that due to COVID-19 and now all showings are on half hour blocks instead of 15 minute blocks uh, in order to uh, uh, minimize the potential for the two parties to cross paths uh, between their at the end of the one showing time and the beginning of the next showing time. So try to stagger those showings as best you can. And again, just remember in the back of your mind, our, the intent of this is to minimize unnecessary in-person contact. So if you can do that by staggering out your showing times, you know, you're, you're working um, uh, in, in good faith as far as, as what the guidelines are supposed to do. Uh, the other thing, too, is that uh, you should advise uh, the buyer or tenant, if you're doing a showing, that they shouldn't touch anything except things that they absolutely have to touch, such as a handrail to get up and down the stairs. Um, if they have to use the facilities, obviously, they would have to flush the toilet or use the sink handles. But uh, anything that the consumer touches, 
uh, the licensee should take note and disinfect that either immediately after them touching it or at the end of the showing uh, when they go around and disinfect other uh, high touch areas such as doorknobs and handrails. Uh, the licensee would be responsible uh, for uh, cleaning the property, sterilizing the property, again, uh, cleaning off high traffic items such as doorknobs and handrails. Uh, this is common sense, but I, I thought I'd have to, to mention, I also put it in, in NYSTAR's FAQs, uh, do not dispose of the personal protective equipment at the property. Put it in a, in a, in a plastic bag, knot it up, throw it away at your house or in your garbage pail somewhere, but, but don't be disposing of those items at the seller's property um, unless the seller provides you with instructions that people can put it in the garbage can outside by the garage or something like that. But you shouldn't be taking off your gloves and everything and throwing them into the uh, uh, garbage of the prop where, where you are at the property unless instructed to do so. Now, there is a provision that permits more than one party to be in the property um, at a given time. And it's my belief, it's my interpretation that this is referring uh, not to having uh, multiple parties for a showing, but perhaps uh, regarding home inspectors. The home inspector would be able to go in and do the inspection and have their client with them. Many home inspectors are interpreting it that way. I'm going to tell you it's not NYSAR's position uh, to interpret what other professions are permitted to do, but I believe that the language is, is formatted in such a way where it does permit uh, the inspector uh, to be in the property uh, with the consumer. Um, the licensee obviously could also be there, although I think you should only go if it's absolutely necessary that you attend. If you can attend virtually, you should. If the guidelines stay for everything. If it can be done remotely, you should do it remotely. Um, <clears throat> so if you can do things remotely, you should. Again, the overall intent is to minimize the potential exposure uh, to, to individuals uh, to COVID-19. Uh, so open houses are permitted, but I'm saying this with a giant asterisk and, and red flashing lights around it, okay? They're permitting open houses, but not in the traditional sense. So you can have an open house, and I'm throwing air quotes. I know you can't see me, but I'm doing my air quotes with open houses. However, having an open house, you can only have one party in the property at a time which means that if you're going to advertise an open house, it's going to be first come, first serve. People are going to be getting in line outside. They're not going to be maintaining social distancing. Uh, you could have a, a serious uh, crowd issue going on. Um, and the next party has to wait, and then they're all going to be crossing paths. And, and it's, it's, I don't think it's in the intent of the, the guidance uh, to have those types of traditional open houses. Uh, what NYSAR is recommending as a best practice is you say on Sunday, um, June 7th, hypothetically, if you were open, uh, you know, there's going to be an open house at 115 Main Street. Um, attendees must register ahead of time, and you have allotted slots uh, for individuals to come and go and let them know that, there's, that their viewing of the property is limited to X amount of minutes. Um, that would be the best way to do it. The licensee stays there all day or however long it happens to be, and then you could have multiple uh, potential purchasers coming in to the property at their assigned time slots um, rather than having them wait outside in lines and, again, risking um, uh, individuals being exposed to COVID-19, including yourself. I mean, this isn't just, I mean, yeah, we're talking about the general public, but we're also talking about you and what you're being exposed to. And, and if there's... 10 families waiting outside for an open house and they're not social distancing, you know, you now have 20 to 30 people that are potentially exposed that are going to be walking by you for the next two hours while they're viewing the, the open house. So uh, although they're permitted, they're permitted one party at a time. And again, we're highly recommending that you um, uh, require attendees to schedule the time that they're coming and limit, uh, if there's a number of people that want to see it, limit the amount of time the person has to view the the open house. Uh, the last thing they say in the in the section is responsible parties are encouraged but not required to conduct remote walkthroughs rather than in-person walkthroughs where possible. And that's going to be up to the consumer. What does the consumer want? What are they comfortable doing? Um, and that's a conversation you're going to have to have. Now, 
Uh, as far as phase two is concerned, NISAR, for those of you who have been using the NISAR COVID-19 disclosure form, uh, we did draft a NISAR COVID-19 phase two disclosure form. Uh, it just changes the language a little bit, but it still has the same effect as the regular COVID-19 disclosure form. Uh, that was sent out uh, earlier this week to association executives uh, for distribution um, to their members, uh, so you can utilize that. Sellers can require that anyone coming into their property signs that form. If they don't sign it, the seller can say, I'm not going to permit you to come into my property. Okay. Uh, the same thing holds true. There's also a questionnaire that's recommended. Uh, so the summary guidance document that's provided from the state has mandatory and recommended best practices. Okay. If it's a recommended best practice, I think you should make every effort to try to comply with the recommended best practices, even though they're not required. Um, I wouldn't want to be the attorney who represents a broker who didn't follow some of the best practices, and as a result, there was a COVID-19 exposure, and when asked, why didn't you do this, the response is, well, because it wasn't required, it was optional. Um, that's really not, that's not something that as an attorney, I'd want to be defending uh, my client for, um, you know, just because they decided not to do it because it was optional. So, you know, make every effort to do those recommended best practices. Um, as Libby mentioned, employers are required to question their employees each day they come to work. Uh, the uh, state is recommending that uh, the screening questionnaire be uh, uh, done to uh, buyers, sellers, landlords, and tenants when they're going to be viewing properties. Um, it's not required, it's recommended. Again, um, the purpose of the questionnaire is for tracking and tracing. So in the event there's an exposure and someone has COVID-19, uh, they can ask the person where they were, they can go back to these documents and see, okay, he was here for this showing, here are the other four people that have been exposed, and they can go and find, you know, patient X, so to speak, um, and warn the others that they, there's a potential exposure. So uh, it's not just an issue for liability. The questionnaire is not a liability issue. The questionnaire is literally one um, for tracking and tracing uh, COVID-19 exposure, uh, especially small group exposures, which are on the rise um, in New York. Uh, the questionnaire itself doesn't have to be on paper. Uh, we're getting many questions at nights are, well, have you drafted a form for us to use? And, and the answer is no, we have not. And we have not for a number of reasons. One is uh, it's NYSAR's position. We're strongly recommending that you do this screening remotely. As Libby mentioned, we have an online um, app to do that. And the reason why it's important to do that is you don't want to have to give somebody the form when they're standing six feet away from you and they answer yes to one of the questions that they were exposed to COVID-19 after you've already had in-person contact with them, right? Minimize the potential for exposure by having them fill out the questionnaire with the three questions ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> you minimize that potential for exposure if they answer yes to one of those questions. Now, my desktop's kind of crowded here. Let me, uh, phase two, okay. So the screening questionnaire requires that there be five specific uh, statements or questions uh, to the consumer. Um, have you knownly been in close or proximate contact in the past 14 days with anyone who has tested positive for COVID-19 or who has had or had symptoms of COVID-19? Second question, have you tested positive for COVID-19 in the past 14 days? And the third question is, have you experienced any symptoms of COVID-19 in the past 14 days? So those three threshold questions were the same questions that employees are going to be asked as well. Um, let you set forth whether or not the person has been exposed or currently has COVID-19, which is why we think it's important because if they say yes to any of those questions, you've now been exposed if you're doing it in person. And, you know, again, we're here to protect everyone's health and safety, but we also want to protect our members as well from unnecessary exposure. Now, for the showing questionnaire, there's two additional questions or two additional statements uh, that the party has to agree to. Sorry if you hear my dogs upstairs. There's a squirrel in the backyard, so um, I apologize for the barking. Uh, that the seller or lessor or buyer lessee 
uh, must disclose if they become symptomatic or they test positive for COVID-19 uh, within 48 hours of the last visit to their property. So this covers after the showing. Um, potentially you have a buyer who comes in and, and they answer no to all the questions, but they go to the doctor tomorrow and, and they test positive for COVID-19. This would require them to contact you to let you know, and then you would then contact the other parties uh, to let them know that there's a potential exposure. Um, this is not a violation of HIPAA. If anyone has any questions about HIPAA, we are not a covered party under HIPAA. Uh, this is a matter of a health and safety emergency. Uh, we have a state of emergency that's been established in New York State. <clears throat> we have guidance telling us to, uh, uh, recommending us to do these questionnaires, which I would, if I were a broker, I wouldn't say that they are uh, optional, I, I, I'd say that they should be mandatory. You're protecting the health and safety of your clients, consumers, and, and your associated licensees. Um, so the questionnaire uh, itself is rather simple. Like I said, you can do it remotely. You do it by phone. All you want to do is log in. You know, today I talked to Richard Haggerty. Um, you know, he said no to all three questions. And then you obviously keep a log of what properties you go to. So if you were then contacted by the Department of Health that said, hey, we had a positive um, from Richard Haggerty, he notified us that he saw a property with you, then they can go back with the tra tracking and tracing to see, you know, how big that tree is going to expand as far as who was in contact with who um, and such forth. So it, it's important, I think, and, and like I said, we highly recommend you, you do the questionnaires. Uh, as a listing agent, you should be asking your seller, how comfortable are you letting people come into your property? Right? We have to have these conversations. We, just because phase two is in effect doesn't mean that we just go back into our regular mindset of what we did before. There are other concerns that we have to discuss with consumers now and potential exposure to COVID-19 or one of them. You may have a seller that says, I don't want anybody in my house. I think they have the right to do so regardless of what personal protection that someone is taking again, under the current state of emergency. Um, they can say that uh, if they don't answer the questionnaire or fill out the COVID-19 disclosure, I won't let them in my property. I think they have the right to do that. Again, this is a liability issue. Um, <clears throat> depending on the seller themselves, again, they can require higher standards, reasonable higher standards. Uh, I don't think they can make people get into a full-blown hazmat suit but I think they could ask them to wear gloves and booties or other uh, nominal kinds of uh, personal protective equipment if they want to. Um, they can obviously limit the number of people that go into their house on a daily basis if they so choose. Again, uh, taking uh, health and safety uh, into consideration. Um, and, you know, it, if someone were to answer yes to one of those three questions, right, I mean, the seller can demand that everyone be screened. The seller can tell you to do that, and, and you would do it. You can recommend to the seller everyone be screened, and the seller can just say no. Um, and that's an issue the broker has to decide whether or not they want to continue uh, uh, with that listing if the seller doesn't want people to be screened. But uh, these are things that, again, like the seller can require. What happens when someone answers yes, that they uh, have been in close contact with someone who tested positive? Well, the seller can say, well, I don't want that person in my property because of risk of potential exposure. Um, so there's a, like I said, there, there's a conversation you have to have with your sellers, current and future ones, as long as we're still under the state of emergency, um, as far as what is their level of comfort with permitting people into their property. And some don't care and some will be uh, a little bit more cautious, I would assume. So um, <clears throat> for those of you uh, uh, who have other questions or, or when this is over, uh, if there's questions, if you go to nysar.com, uh, we have a COVID-19 resource page. Uh, on that page is an FAQ section. We've recently updated it with phase two reopening um, FAQs as well as uh, guidance uh, for real estate activity. Um, so that's a resource that you can utilize as well. But the other thing you may have in your favor, and, and again, this isn't legal, this is common sense, but uh, if you have friends or, or associates that work in areas that are open under phase two now, you can give them a call and see how they're doing things, see how things are working, see how consumers are reacting. Um, you know, you have a, a precedent, so to speak, um, with a lot of the upstate and western New York areas that are open under phase two, uh, that you can tap those resources, so to speak, just to, if you have any questions about 
you know, uh, pitfalls that they had, roadblocks, um, uh, matters they had difficulty complying with. Uh, so, so again, those are resources that, that you can also utilize as far as phase two. Um, the other thing too, just, and this is common sense, uh, but there, there, the, the state also recommends that uh, uh, licensees not be riding in cars with consumers unless they have masks on. So unless it's absolutely necessary, um, I would not be going and driving around uh, consumers in your vehicle. Um, again, just want to minimize the potential for any uh, exposure uh, to COVID-19. Okay, that's it. So Anthony, a couple of questions real quick. Uh, in terms of licensees, uh, as independent contractors, you said that if they're coming into the office, they should fill out the health questionnaire. Correct. What if they are showing properties? Because you also indicated that if they're showing properties, they are engaging in a work activity. Should they complete the health questionnaire before showing a property? I believe they should, Richard. That's kind of why I, I was trying to categorize that under work site as compared to office. So although it's not your physical office, it's still a work site of the broker. So I believe that they would have to be answering um, that questionnaire on days when they're having in-person contact. Great. Another quick question about the fair housing requirements. As you know, there are a lot of virtual showings of properties and virtual open houses. How would you handle the uh, fair housing notice requirement for a virtual open house? Well, I think that again, electronic delivery is gonna save the day in this situation, Richard. So um, other than emailing them the disclosure form if you want to, uh, you can also email them the link to that fair housing notice with a little bit of text saying, you know, uh, the following is a link to the fair housing disclosure form. You know, the following is a link to the fair housing, sorry, housing and anti-discrimination disclosure form, housing and anti-discrimination notice. And I think that would suffice. Great. Do you have time for, for some questions? I see that we do have a number of questions. Do you have some time for that? Yeah, I've got time. Okay. Gary, can you take over the... Uh... I certainly can. Uh, so, listing agents are requiring hold harmless agreements signed by each property separately by buyers. Can we have a single generic hold harmless agreement by the buyer that it can be used for any property the buyer wants to see? Uh, I don't see why not, but that'd be, have to be something that'd be drafted specifically by the broker or by a local board. NYSAR had drafted a whole Thomas agreement previously um, that we provided to the local boards, but uh, that'd be something that a broker would, would have to have their own attorney draft for them. Thank you. Um, did you say that there was details for, for texting a fair housing disclosure? Yeah, I'll read you the exact section. Hold on a second. So this is contained in 19 NYCRR section 175.28. Um, paragraph B. Uh, the disclosure may be sent by any of the following means, email, text, electronic messaging system, facsimile, or hard copy. An electronic communication containing a link to the disclosure notice required uh, under this section uh, shall be permissible provided the communication also contains text to inform the prospective purchaser, tenant, seller, landlord that the link contains information regarding New York State human rights law. So yes, it permits any kind of electronic uh, transmission. Great. Um, who needs to read and affirm the detailed guidelines? Broker owners and licensees or only the brokers? Uh, the broker slash owner or their designated agent, um, licensees are not required to do it. Again, the document refers to licensees as being employees. Um, so for instance, for NISAR, I don't have to affirm it because uh, I'm an employee of NISAR, but uh, Libby or Duncan um, would have to do it. So it's just the broker owner that would have to do it. Perfect. Um, if an office has a visitor, do we have to require them to fill out that health questionnaire? But yes, you do. Um, and again, uh, and again, all visitors to the office should be necessary visitors, not unnecessary visitors. So I imagine the answer is yes, that you're required to have customers fill out an exposure questionnaire at every meeting. Uh, 
Um, again, I think if you're having the meeting in the office, then yes, because they're coming into the office. If you are going to their property, I think it's it's the same thing as a showing. I would I would recommend that you have it done. Um, again, I don't want to be the broker that has to answer to the state as to why we decided not to do something that was recommended. Um, you know that really won't won't bode well for for the broker uh, and, and their 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 image, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, if a seller refuses to leave but will wear a mask, can they remain in the house for a showing? The answer is no. Um, I think the only real exception to this, and we haven't gotten guidance on this yet, if the person um, is, is immobile or to remove them would be some type of burden. Um, in that case, the person should uh, isolate themselves um, you know, in, a, in a room um, and the individuals viewing the property would not go in there. But uh, that's a very, very, very narrow exception. And, and if the person has health issues, I don't know why they'd be allowing other people into their home anyway if they're at an at-risk population. But um, again, very, very narrow exceptions to that, I, I believe. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a husband and wife, can they go together with the, with the realtor for a showing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they would they would constitute being the parties. Um, you know, like I said, it's when they bring Uncle Ted with them. Uh, you know, because Uncle Ted used to put up decks on the back of people's houses and knows about properties. I think that's where it gets kind of uh, um, questionable. Or you know, you have a, a very close uh, um, uh, family and they all want to come. I, I think that that should be discouraged um, and only have the the parties that are essential to the transaction viewing the property. Um, can access to a listing property be denied by the listing agent if the buyer and or the, and or the buyer's agent refuses to sign a hold, har hold harmless agreement? Uh, that would have to be with permission of the seller. So they'd have to have a conversation with their client um, and the client would have to approve that if they wanted to. Um, the licensee would then, if they, when they have that conversation, wouldn't necessarily have to, if they didn't feel comfortable, um, represent that individual. Um, and the broker can assign someone else in the office who's more comfortable doing so. Um, but that'd be a conversation you'd have at the time of the listing agreement. Um, and if the seller says, well, I don't want the whole harmless distributed and the broker says, well, you know, then we you know, can't represent you. That's up to the broker prior to the signing of the listing agreement. But it's something the seller would have to agree to. Okay. Uh, what happens if you're working with a healthcare provider who is working with COVID patients? Um, again, they would, if, if you're doing a questionnaire, they would answer the questionnaire honestly. Um, you know, if they say that, yes, they've been exposed to someone who had COVID-19, you can discuss, if you haven't already discussed that with the seller, you discuss with the seller. You can explain the fact that it's a healthcare worker. Um, you know, they are uh, uh, trained to take necessary precautions, proper necessary precautions. Um, but again, that would just be, be based on whatever uh, comfort level um, that seller has or, or their potential risk factors if they were exposed to COVID-19. Okay. Uh, if you could please clarify, is the questionnaire required to be presented and filled out at showings or is it recommended? The state recommends it as a, as a best practice. It's not required for showing that it's required for um, employer employees, but it's not required for the general public to do it. But like I said, I, I would strongly recommend that you, that you utilize it. Should we consider having an indemnification for agents to sign to limit liability to, broker, to brokers for agent exposure? That, that would be a broker by broker determination. They'd have to discuss that with their own uh, legal counsel. That's not a, an opinion that NYSER would be able to provide. Uh, now that we have, now that we will be uh, hopefully opening offices and begin in-person showings regarding independent contractors or employees who travel by plane, should we ask them to be quarantined for two weeks? I have an agent who flies back and forth to Florida during the past few months and will continue to do so? Uh, I don't know if the guidelines specifically refer to out-of-state travel, but 
um, I would just abide by whatever guidelines are provided by either the state or the CDC as far as quarantining is concerned and, and travel, uh, you know, in or out of the United States. Um, what, do you, what do you suggest agents do if, I, if hosting a virtual open house, live stream or tour and the, with the fair housing notice? I think uh, I answered that initially for Richard. Um, you can provide it to them by email. If, if you're using a platform, uh, you can have the link there. And for people that are viewing it, you know, for those of you who are viewing the open house today, you know, a copy of the link is provided in here or in the email you got, or, you know, you can either deliver it to them that way, or like I said, have it available uh, somewhere, um, whatever uh, platform you're using for the virtual open house. Uh, if a selling agent is showing my property to their clients, do I need to screen the selling agent? Is it, no, because the assumption is that their broker did it. Right? Each broker has their own obligation to screen those employees or independent contractors that are coming to the office or, again, in my opinion, uh, having in-person contact with members of the public. Uh, so that individual would have already been screened. Um, however, if their client or customer was not screened, and the seller uh, requires them to do so, you can screen their client or customer if they haven't. Can the questionnaire be asked and answered verbally without completing it with pen and paper? The, again, NYSAR is not recommending you do it on pen and paper. We're recommending you do it remotely. You would just have to keep a log of who you're screening and what the answers to questions, you know, one, two, and three are. Um, that's really the only requirement you have. So, so you wouldn't really need to have a form per se. You know, like I said, we recommend doing it remotely, either by phone or um, like Google Form or someplace like you know. There's some third-party apps you can utilize to do it as well. Okay. <clears throat> Are brokers required to supply PPE for independent contractors? Yes. Uh, the guidance uh, clarifies defines independent contractors as being employees and uh, employers are required to provide those to employees uh, for the purpose of their employment, which would mean if they come into the office uh, or I believe as well for, for showings, if they don't have their own face covering. Okay. <clears throat> Is there a phase three for real estate where the rules of phase two may be relaxed? Has the state plan for the next step for real estate after phase two? Uh, not to the best of our knowledge, you know, this whole, pandemic state of emergency matter related to COVID-19 has really been a wait and see for the industry. And it's all going to be based upon the metrics and how the numbers are working. Maybe if they relax these standards a little bit more, but um, I don't think you'll see social distancing relax until after phase four. So I think that those, those restrictions will probably stay in place until um, the governor has determined that it's no longer a risk uh, to the public at large. Okay. <clears throat> one, one minute. I'm just trying to, we've asked and answered some of these questions. If you utilize the questionnaire for the public and you are a listing agent, should you be doing it for both buyer and the buyer's agent? And if you're the buyer's agent, would you not want to do it for the seller? Again, I think that that follows the answers I had previously regarding the questionnaire itself. Um, again, you're going to assume that the other licensee has been screened properly by their broker um, under the, the master guidance for real estate when they affirm that. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I guess if, if the buyer was concerned and wanted to make sure that the seller wasn't exposed, they could ask if the seller had the questionnaire, the seller can obviously refuse to answer it, and it's up to the buyer whether or not they want to view that property. Um, but I think the seller has more control over whether or not a buyer fills one out than the buyer has control over a seller. Anthony, can I weigh in? Because I've looked at a couple of the questions, and I want to be very clear that there are two different things being discussed. One is the uh, COVID-19 disclosure that NISAR is uh, modified to phase two. Uh, that's on the NYSAR site. It's also, the link is on our site. That is different than a hold harmless agreement. Uh, 
Every firm has got to determine whether they wish to pursue that. That is a different type of agreement that would have to be done with uh, your own legal counsel. Uh, and there, you know, there have been some discussions amongst the attorneys across the state about the wisdom of that because it does potentially create a liability for the seller client if you are the listing agent. But that does not preclude you from having your seller, I'm sorry, your attorney prepare a whole harmless agreement. Uh, and that's an individual decision, but they're two different types of forms. Am I, am I characterizing that correctly? Yeah, correct. So I assume we can provide we can provide final walkthroughs, but can we now attend closings? Uh, you can do final walkthroughs. You cannot go to closings. It's not necessary for you to be at a closing. Again, uh, everything should be done remotely when possible. Uh, I don't know of any uh, legally necessary situation where a licensee would have to attend a closing. Um, you know, collecting a commission check does not justify the licensee going to the closing. So at this point in time, I'm advising that, that licensees not attend closings. Okay. Does a seller need to fill out the questionnaire daily if their property would be shown daily? Uh, if you are doing the questionnaire, I would say yes. Um, again, it could be something as simple as you firing off an email to the seller uh, that morning, um, you know, with the questions or giving them a call on the phone before the showing and just going over the questions again. And you'd have a conversation with them. Hopefully they would understand uh, why you have to do it. Um, but yeah, I, I believe they would have to do it. it. Again, it's voluntary, but if they want to do it, it'd be the day of every, every show. Did you say there was a, a, a an app for the questionnaire? Uh, no, what I said is that there were uh, some brokerages who were utilizing apps, um, uh, both for the questionnaire, like Google Forms or SurveyMonkey or something like that for the for the COVID-19 questionnaire, uh, they were also using apps um, for delivery of the fair housing documents. So they're, they're two different things, but uh, yeah, there are, there are third party apps out there. I'm not familiar with any, um, but I know that they do exist after discussions with our IT department. Okay. Um. Maybe just two more questions, Gary, because I want to be respectful of uh, Libby and Anthony's time. Absolutely. Uh, what about going on listing appointments and viewing the property for listing? Is that allowed in phase two? Yes, and, and you do the same restrictions you would do for a showing. Uh, you and the party would have to wear masks, uh, maintain social distancing. Um, you know, there's other recommendations as well that are within there, such as, you know, opening all the doors and windows if possible to make sure that there's some type of circulation or cross breeze. Um, again, that's not mandatory, but I think the more precautions you take, again, the more you're looking out for your own health and safety as well as that of the general public. So my final question will be, can the brokerage have all agents sign an acknowledgement that will abide by the daily questionnaire? Would that be sufficient and allow the brokerage to not have to send a daily questionnaire to every agent every day? I think that would depend on the method and medium at which the brokerage is, is having that, that questionnaire delivered to their licensees. Um, I believe, you know, the, the broker would have to, I believe the broker would be ultimately responsible regardless of, of whatever type of, of affirmation or, or document they have their licensee sign. Um, as the employer, again, because the way that it's defined within the document, uh, it's the broker's ultimate responsibility to make sure that they're doing it. If they're confident that a simple, you know, uh, warning at the onset of this, uh, of opening under phase two would be enough, that, that's, you know, the risk the broker wants to take. But uh, the broker should make some uh, have some policy in place or some mechanism in place whereby um, they know that the licensees are filling them out. Okay. And if I could just make one final statement before Richard wraps up, uh, you can find the documents mentioned today at hjar.com in your dashboard under the Broker Owner Manager Fair Housing Toolkit, including a copy of the NYSARS FAQs. Thank you very much, Anthony.
Richard? I have, I actually have one more question, Anthony. It's Gail Fatisi. Um, with regard to record keeping for these health questionnaires, what type of record keeping requirements are there? So as far as record keeping is concerned, there's nothing specifically set forth in the guidance, but I think that, that what you have to keep in mind as far as your retention is concerned is you must uh, retain the records in such a way that if you are contacted because there's exposure that you can backtrack and see, you know, who is at what properties at one day and, and, and who are they. So I think that's the only real kind of, of requirement there is. Um, you may have uh, licensees doing it differently within the same brokerage that the broker permits. Uh, the broker can obviously mandate a certain method or certain medium as far as doing the questionnaire is concerned. Um, but again, you just want to make sure that it's being recorded in such a way where if you're contacted by the Department of Health because John Smith was exposed, you can go back and say, okay, John Smith was at 15 Main Street and here's the number of people that were there, here's the individuals that were also there at the time. So that sounds like more record keeping for who was where as opposed to the actual answers to the specific questions in the health questionnaire? Correct. The answers only become important if the person answers yes, right? Which we would so know right away. if they away. answer no, yeah, if they answer no, then you just record that. And like I said, in the event someone else who was there was exposed, you can go back and, and find the, the name and the place. You know, if they answer yes, then there's another issue. Um, you know, if they answer yes, if they tested positive for COVID-19 in the past 14 days, you know, that's, <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but that's, that's problematic, right? So now you have someone who's a potential care, who's a carrier that could potentially spread that. So, um, you know, those, those, you know, if they answer no, you're just recording place and time. If they answer yes, then, you know, you take the next steps um, to minimize that potential spread of that exposure. Thank you. Um, I also want to add before I leave, if you have any questions uh, when you enter phase two or about entering phase two, um, you can contact NYSAR's legal hotline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., 518-436-9727 or 518-43-NYSAR. Uh, you will get myself or my associate Liz on the phone. And um, like I said, we have uh, the benefit of, uh, of uh, getting calls from those areas that are currently open under phase two. So we do have at least some uh, uh, knowledge as far as, as how the, the reopening has been occurring in other parts of the state. Anthony, Libby, thank you so, so much. This was tremendously helpful. It was very timely. Uh, we did have a question about whether we'd be doing a session for all agents. Uh, the answer to that is no, but we will be publishing uh, this recording so that brokers and agents both can uh, see this uh, at, at any time you wish. Uh, so it's been very helpful. We can't thank you enough. Uh, NYSAR has been a true partner throughout the COVID-19 crisis, and we really value that partnership. Gail, any closing words? No, other, you know, just what you said, I, we really appreciate Libby and Anthony, your time and uh, contribution to this session. And uh, certainly we'll make sure that our agents or our broker owner managers have the hotline. So if they do have further questions, they can contact you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. Everybody be safe. Be safe, be well. We really appreciate it. Have a great weekend.